Okay, I think we start. Welcome to Cockonomics, the largest, the biggest, the best, and the most funniest economics festival in the Nordic countries. It's been organized this year for the seventh time. Welcome all. And it, today it's a pleasure for me to welcome two on the stage sitting here. First one is Andres Rodriguez Poser. Uh, some of you ha might have seen him yesterday, and he has also been visiting us, is it for four, fourth years, having lectures for us? Uh, you will be commenting on the lecture that will be held by Pierre Ale uh, Ballant. You're a French economist and one of the Europe's leading experts on complex system, the future of city and, a and AI. And today you are going to talk about the geography of AI. And before I let you uh, start your talk, I'm just going to introduce myself because I forgot it. My name is Celia Hausreve, and I'm part of the editorial board of Cockonomics. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Celia, for the invitation. I've heard about this festival for a couple of years, and now finally I'm honored to be on stage and enjoy it. Um, I heard that this is just the coolest festival, economic festival on Earth, <laughs> and I can see that this is true. I mean, seriously. Cheers, everyone. Andres? <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about a topic that is, I would say, on everyone's mind. And if it's not yet, I hope it will be at the end of this presentation. And presentation, not a lecture. It's like fun time between us. It's more a way to prompt questions in your mind because AI has an impact on all of us. I mean, you're using AI. Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. When you're using Spotify, Amazon, when you're on social media, the algorithm that's filtering the news that you see, that's basically selecting what you see and what you don't see, is an AI. Self-driving cars, large language models, chat GPT, all of that is powered by artificial intelligence. So it has an impact on the jobs of the future. It has an impact on the skills that are relevant and the one that might become obsolete because can be done by a machine. So it is something very essential that we need to think about. And I really wish that it will not be something that only experts think about. But this is something that all citizens should be involved and uh, I'm very happy when there is a chance to also have this kind of conversation. We're going to talk about the geography of AI. Almost the entire slide deck is AI generated. But no humans or machine were hurt in the process. <laughs> and if you look at this one, maybe you can see Celia that was giving a presentation. Uh, we have Andres somewhere holding a, a cello. <laughs> and this AI was trying to capture the idea and the atmosphere of this festival. So I hope it's doing a good job. <laughs> okay. So I have a question for you. I'm not going to do all the talking, right? So I have a question for you. And it's, it's not a simple question. It's a much deeper question that it might, think, that it might seem. What makes us human? Our consciousness. Consciousness. It, it's an excellent, excellent, excellent answer. DNA. Sorry? DNA. Feelings. Ooh, you're, you're, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Feelings, consciousness. This is something right now, boss, that the scientific community on AI can agree upon that has not been achieved by AI. So you're, you're good. Something else? Uh, I was waiting for this one. Thank you, and <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to measure creativity, right? Well, yeah. It's very hard, and we have tests. So for instance, the Torrance test is like the standard to measure creativity. You might discuss whether it's a good one or bad one, but as a standard that we use to rank humans, you can see how AI performs. It defeats 99% of the top Stanford students. What else? Creativity. And we can, we can talk about it like way longer, but I just want to grab a couple of thoughts. Emp wow. 
Okay, all of that crowd, you guys are AI experts. <laughs> Want to join me on stage? Believe. believe. How would you define believe? Ooh, actually in the AI world, we call that hallucination. <laughs> when a, when a, when <laughs> <laughs> so when a model hallucinates, and that's actually one of the big critiques of large language models, we, we see that sometimes it makes things up. So AI hallucination is when a large language model makes things up. And why does it make things up? Because a large language model predicts the next token, the next word, right? So it is a probabilistic model. It's the most likely. It's sometimes what is the most likely is not the right answer. So it hallucinates. It makes things up. And that's actually a limitation of uh, So we can make this up. I mean, we, humans are really good at making things up, but also machines. OK, a last one. Yes. Oh. Hope. Wow. My, this guy's good. <laughs> No, I, I'm not joking uh, that when I say you're good, because we have a framework that we're developing with colleagues from, um, from, from MIT. It's called Epoch. And each of them, E, is for empathy. The H of Epoch is for hope. Uh, th there is like a framework where we, we're trying to see what is the frontier. And you, you kind of all nailed it. And the uh, last one? Genetics. Genetics? Great one. <laughs> All right. So let's think about some of the key uh, issues that make us uh, human. And if you will ask Will Smith in the iRobot movie, can a robot write a symphony? That was kind of the state of the art by the time, right? We really saw that creativity was the frontier. I've watched videos of this AI kind of conferences 10 years ago about what, what is the limit, what it is that makes us human, what it is that robots cannot do. And it was all about that. Writing music, poetry, art, creativity. And we saw that. Can a robot write a symphony? Actually, yes. If you're interested, I can show you uh, what has been done. But the last, one of the last symphonies of, uh, of Beethoven was completed by AI. And even experts tell you that this is pretty good. Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? pretty impressive what AI can do. And if you haven't tried, the last DALI 3, which is uh, text to image generation, ow, this is really good. So actually, in the movie, do you know what's the next line? It's an excellent response, because the, the, the robot answer. So lo look at the face of uh, Will Smith. Can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas to a beautiful masterpiece? And the robot answers, can you? <laughs> So we tend to judge robots and machines and artificial intelligence with a standard that usually we don't apply to humans. I was having this conversation uh, yesterday, I flew yesterday, no, uh, the day before, with someone that was very anti-tech, and there are good reason to be anti-tech. And she was telling me that as soon as a self-driving car will lead to road incidents, we cannot have self-driving cars. But that's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is what, what is the benchmark? The benchmark is humans falling asleep, making mistakes, driving drunk. So if you can do something better, I mean, why would you evaluate machine with a different framework? These are questions. I'm not saying you should, you know, that there are maybe a reason why we should be harder with machines than, than humans. But these are valid questions to ask. So what is AI? And here, I don't want to go too deep into that, but I want to kind of set the stage also for a conversation, because AI is not magic. Uh, what AI is truly, it's a prediction machine. So the notion of intelligence, actually very often in the literature, is associated with understanding. There is no evidence that AI understands anything. But what an AI can do is to predict. So it can predict really well the next song that you're going to listen to, next movie you're going to watch, next product you want to buy, the next word in a sequence of words. Okay? All of that it can do, and the next pixel and rearrange stuff. So it predicts and it builds upon a sequence of prediction. Okay? It's very mechanical. It's not entirely understanding what's going on. But then you can also ask, I mean, 
Are we different from that? <laughs> We're all university professors. We have students that are really good at memorizing stuff. And sometimes we wonder, do they understand? Or they're just good at memorizing and then they spit it out the day of the test. So there is a bit of this evaluation framework, but <clears throat> right now, AI is very much a black box, but it just makes really good prediction at a very low price. We're in an econ event, huh? so price matters. Now, to understand, if I would have to describe the two waves of AI, there's been really two. And the reason why we have AI today is because at some point we had internet. So internet data is very different from your enterprise data. I don't know if some of you work in a company, but when you try to deploy an AI solution in a company, oh boy, it's a nightmare. Because data silos don't speak to each other. But the internet data is really nice because when I like something, when I listen to something, this information is recorded in the same way than when you do it. So it's just a very clean database and basically produces and populates a matrix. So you see this matrix? Here you have people, and here you have movies or any kind of thing you want. It can be product, can be anything you want. What these big AI companies have is this matrix very well populated, and that's basically they predict transition. That's very, very simple. The framework is extremely simple. And that's because we had internet data at a massive scale that we could do that. And we developed something we call recommender systems. The second wave of AI started in November last year, exactly one year ago, and it was launched by what we call large language models. And ChatGPT is one of them, but you have a lot of other models here you see uh, the ChatGPT, but you have Stable Diffusion, Palm, Gemini from Google is uh, being released, uh, Llama from Meta, and they all have their own characteristics. But essentially, they were trained on the entire corpus of internet data. So you can imagine that this model, they read the entire web. They read what you, the Medium article that you posted. They read your social media. They read your blog. They read basically pretty much everything. Also, very ugly things. So you have to train the model to behave because sometimes you, know, you don't want to replicate the bad things that humans do. But that was the second wave of, um, of AI. So you have recommended system and what we call large language models. These are the two models that are really, really, really having a widespread impact on our economy. And it's important to think about AI, not in isolation with other technologies, but mainly with blockchain. If you think about AI, as uh, something that can produce a lot of stuff. Well, it can produce good things, but it can also produce bad things. It can also produce fake news, right? You could have a video of, of me speaking and you know, saying silly things, even more silly than now. That, that could be done. Blockchain allows you to verify. So somehow if you bring blockchain technology at scale, okay, verification at scale, that's the thing. Huh? I mean, uh, we have verification mechanism. But blockchain allows you to do that at, at scale, which means you could have a signature, meaning if you see a video of Barack Obama saying that he's a very good friend with Donald Trump, that's not enough. You need like a stamp. And that could be something generated through authentication that blockchain can provide. The metaverse and AR, VR, IoT is also the part that connects AI to the physical world. And essentially, what you can think about AI is going to have an impact on everything. Already, it's happening. We, we're doing this research. We're analyzing the impact, the, not the hypothetical impact, the actual real impact in different industries, in real estate, in banking. Think about real estate. Real estate is the largest asset class in the world, but we are buying houses today the way we're buying houses 50 years ago. It doesn't evolve. Banking. I mean... How often are you going to a branch? A lot of the banking today is mobile or based on a desktop. And a bank like Bank of America has 300,000 employees. Competing with Apple Pay, which is super lean. Huge pressure coming. So healthcare, automobile, in almost every industry, the traditional player will have to reinvent themselves to AI at scale. And we're not going to go into that. <laughs> But I, I, in, in my long talk, I go into that in every industry, from banking, communication, gaming, social network, defense, cybersecurity, healthcare, all of them. And in all of them, you can really see the use cases and like, oh, wow, this is happening fast. And there's a massive gap between what's happening and what the, the public, the audience, the, the, the citizens know. Uh, 
Now, the geography of all of that. It's such a powerful technology. It's changing our life. And geography matters here. And we all actually know each other. We're all colleagues because we belong to what we call an economic geography community. And, and you have here like superstars of this community. Couple of facts about the geography of AI. The first one is that it's a bipolar world, China, the US. If you want to know where the AI you're consuming comes from, this is the US, this is China. Europe is very much lagging behind in this field for many reasons. And we're not going to go too much into the reason. But maybe one key is that the US had a head start on the com commercialization on the internet and the web. Actually come from Europe. Eh? It was developed at CERN by a British engineer. But then the commercialization, like a lot of stuff, we're really good at producing research and science. But then when it turns to technology and commercial application, the US is just way better at that. So they had a head start. And that allowed to basically create these AI companies. Because if you have a, you remember, if you have the, the control on the internet data, then you can train your model. It's basically how it works. What China did in the early 2000s was to close their internet space. And they created a parallel universe, which allowed them to create also this AI technology without competition. When they were very weak, instead of competing with very strong US titans, they could develop their industry. Europe didn't do the same. We're talking about this morning, but the very first social network, the very first Facebook, is not from the US. It was actually in Europe, two years before Facebook. International Who is Who from Hungary. It was called International Who is Who from Hungary. And everyone that had access to internet in Hungary, almost everyone, 99% of population, actually was on that. It was crazy. Ask Hungarians that from my generation, they will remember that. So we have the capacity. That's not the problem. The problem is that in this case, we could not scale it because it was Hungarian. So the network is about, I don't know, 8 million people. So when Facebook entered, network effect, you know, like it's way better to have access to the Facebook technology. So everybody left the network and went to Facebook. So basically what Europe has been doing for like 30 years now is being a user of AI US technology or Chinese technology. If your kids are using TikTok, they're using one of the most advanced AI technology that comes from China. Uh, won't bother you too much with that, but essentially, these are the tech companies that produce AI in the US in green, in China is blue. Basically, it is very big. Same when you look at startups, look at what, where the AI startups come from. These are the top 1,000 AI startups. And this is in terms of funding, how much funding they receive. You see OpenAI being the largest one here. This is the US. Blue is China. And you see tiny Europe here trying to compete. I'm going to just skip this one. So first fact was, it's a very US-China dominated world. And by the way, the US does not like that. A couple of days ago, one of the big news was trying to cut the hardware, because how do you train these models? You need data, you need computing power, you need GPU, so you need like chips, right? You heard about this chip. And the US is cutting the export of NVIDIA chip to, the, to China. So they want to starve the ability to compute and train large language models. By the way, I'm telling you already, that doesn't work, because what China is doing is creating its own chips. So you're moving from being dependent to the US to creating your industry. China is way too big, way too advanced, investing 80 times what France is investing in AI. A second fact that is a bit sad, again, this is all AI generated. So every time you see a picture like that, that was done in partnership with uh, Dali. Dali like the painter, Dali. Uh, and here what you see also is it's a winner takes all world. So the AI world is very different from all the type of industries where we can all flourish. We all use the same stuff. If I look at the type of phone you're using, type of AI technology you're using, we all use the same stuff. So it's a winner takes all world. Once you have a, a standard, like a, a number one, a best, why would you use a second best? So the AI world is a winner takes all. So if you look at where this innovation comes from, you see big spikes and then nothing in the middle. 
And one of the reasons, in the context of AI, is that as soon as somehow, for whatever reason, you have a little bit of a better product, or people know about your product, you attract more customers, more users. Once you have more users, you have more data. More data, remember, lead to better algorithm. But now iterate this loop a thousand times, and then you get to a winner takes all. A snowball that is gigantic. And by the way, the US companies have been brilliant at that. Who uses Gmail? Right, I mean, OK, everybody. How much do you pay for Gmail? Most of you, zero. If you have a company and you want your name, you know, your company name, you pay a little bit, but tiny. How, how is that sustainable? Well, you get a service for free at an exchange. Where the product? You, your data is being used. So you give the data, and you get a service for free. And again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Eric Brancholfon, for instance, say that that doesn't show up in GDP, but it's something great. It's a great thing that we use, but it doesn't show in GDP. But it's a service that is really making us more productive and better. But we need to understand the mechanism and how, how, how that works. Now, big one. AI and the future of work. AI and the new geography of jobs. That is a part where the impact will be massive. That was just last week. Amazon employs 2.2 million people in the US. Imagine having this workforce I mean, on your payroll. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of people. At the same time, they invest 1 billion into what, something they call industrial transition fund. For what? To basically automate this task. This little guy here is called Digit. And we met him last week. See? Th Thursday, 19th of October, exactly one week ago. Little Digit is built a little bit different than us. See, the legs are, are bending in the other side. See, my legs bend like this. Digit bend like this. Well, I cannot do it, obviously. <laughs> Apparently, in robotics, this is better for balance, because then you can carry stuff. I mean, you, you see what I'm trying to do, right? <laughs> so apparently, nature messed up when they build us. If you want to carry a lot of stuff, this is better. And the problem is like it's better, it's faster, it's cheaper, never goes on strike, never complains, work 24-7, gets better every day. So that's the future of the workforce, and they, they can manipulate. Now, in an AI conference two years ago, if we would have ask questions about really what makes us human or what machine cannot do. In the physical space, one thing that people would have said is like dexterity. That was really the, the, the cutting edge of research in AI. It's like in the physical AI, it's like dexterity. Have you ever played with this pen when you were a kid in school? You know, like and you're trying to spin it around your fingers? I was really bad at that. But this is a Reka from NVIDIA and they solved this problem. The dexterity, that's also why um, we were always saying hairdresser can be automatized because of dexterity. The Eureka from NVIDIA has better dexterity than any human will ever have. And again, the big difference is that we are not getting, we, we are not improving every year. The AI world of today compared to last year is a completely different game. So just try to forecast in 20 years. This is just the beginning, basically. This is the infancy of AI. And if, then you have to think about, and there's a lot of literature. I cite a few here, just in case some people might be interested. Started with Frey and Osborne, Webb, uh, Eric Brancholf, from, uh, how do you pronounce it? Thank you. I'm always, that's always what I'm trying to say, but you know, it doesn't come out that way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's great that we are in a Nordic conference here. Um, and there's a lot of work to try to evaluate which jobs basically can be impacted by automation. But because different cities around the world have different job composition, by definition, AI will have a lot of different impact in different places in the world. So here you see some of the, the two top junior programmers, junior software developers. There were occupations that were safe last year, and today they're not. In my own work, I used to spend days, or I, I mean people spending days, to do like code cleaning, code, uh, code optimization, things like that. Large language models, 
connect to the API, it's automatic. I have a pipeline where I cannot even evaluate the amount of time I've been saving over the past year. It's insane. Point of the story, you don't need junior developers. You, do, you don't need junior programmers. You need a couple of seniors that know how to use this tool. Paralegal, I don't know who is a lawyer here. Paralegal uh, and legal assistants, same issue. Now, it doesn't mean that, again, uh, let's not forget about something. The AI hallucinates. So you have to be checking. But so are junior assistants. No good lawyer for a big deal, for a big M&A, will just blindly trust the assistant. Your role is to check. You're, you're liable. So it's basically becoming a super assistant. But you see that different countries have different uh, impact of automation. So this, this research on the geography of job at risk is that's the future also of, of, of our field in that, in that respect. Now, what's super interesting, do you know this gentleman? Raise your hand if you know him. Who is this gentleman? CEO of OpenAI. So just OpenAI produces one product that's called ChatGPT, many others. It's a transformer base, so it's based on deep learning. And they're very good friends with Microsoft. They receive 11 billion from Microsoft. So when you think OpenAI, think that it's not open and it's Microsoft. <laughs> really. It started open, but then it, it closed pretty, pretty soon. And Elon Musk is very unhappy about that because he funded the first round of OpenAI. Now, this gentleman, you said CEO of OpenAI. That's it? He's also the CEO of WorldCoin. Remember how I said that AI and blockchain? OK, today blockchain is, uh, sorry, AI. Everybody wants to talk about AI. You invited me to talk about AI because AI Cool topic. Blockchain will be, ooh, let's not talk about blockchain. But I have great things to say about blockchain. Not crypto, more like blockchain itself, like the, the database structure of peer-to-peer, -peer decentralized. He's also the CEO of WorldCoin. Who has heard about WorldCoin? Only one person, so great. <coughs> WorldCoin is a blockchain will scan your retina as a proof of verification, proof of identity. And essentially, the idea, so it's valued at 3 billion right now, the idea of WorldCoin to make the loop between the two. This is going to take a lot of jobs. Nobody doubts that. This technology will take a lot of jobs. It probably will create other ones. That's a, another question. But it will take a lot of jobs. In the short and very fast compared to other technologies before. Very fast. That's the big difference. They created WorldCoin to create basically a UBI. That's the attempt to redistribute the wealth. That increased productivity, but some people will lose. That's a way to give you access to, sorry, when I say UBI, universal basic income through the blockchain. So we verify that you're human. We get access of your biometric data. There are some discussion about that. <laughs> and then you get access to part of the cake. This is the new economics, by the way. We have to think about it. Um, basically, there are evidence that AI complements and augments the complex cognitive skills. So basically, it's a tool. So it's like a bicycle for your brain, right? It's like it makes your brain work better. Uh, and a big question here, and I'm, I'm closing on that, because I'm sure I'm beyond time. Still, wh where, where do we stand as European in this AI world order? And I'm very much involved in basically drafting the EU strategy for AI. So anything that comes from AI at the EU level, I'm very close to and I'm, I'm going to be working closer with European institutions in the coming years. So what do we have in Europe and what's, what's our role? Big question, right? Well, first of all, well, we have AI hubs. We have AI hubs and they are basically Paris, Munich, London, North Brabant. And we have not yet hubs, but basically places that punch above their weight. So it's not like they, they produce a lot, but they disproportionately produce more than we would expect based on the size of the, of the place. And, and we do have places that can compete at the worldwide scale. Not Europe, not France, not Norway, but some places. So when you look at the startup cities, for instance, the US looks bad compared to 
China and, and, and Europe. But if you look at Paris compared to Seattle, Boston, Chicago, Austin, it's not that bad. So some of these hubs, they have the potential actually to compete. Something that is very, very fresh and new, we see a new generation of open, truly open source generative AI coming to Europe. And you see Europe starting to lead the race in that part. We have to make sure we grab this window of opportunity, we invest massively where the capabilities are, and we stop the brain drain of our European scientists going to Europe. Like the number one deep learning expert in the world is actually French, Yann Le Kuhn. He was in France 20 years ago, and now he's the head of AI for Facebook, Meta. You know, like this needs to, to stop somehow. If you look at the top 100 uh, AI scientists, you see a lot of Europeans, but they're not in Europe. Mistral AI, for instance, is one of the best examples. Uh, it has produced a large language model, it's a Paris company, from people from uh, DeepMind, from uh, Google, from Meta, uh, that basically came back to Paris, and they don't want to build, that's interesting, they don't want to build in Europe, uh, sorry, in the US. Why? Because of values, because of the way the AI is being built, which is highly for commercial purpose. And they feel like Europe, which by the way has a huge tradition of uh, open source. I mean, think about the web again that was invented in Europe and a lot of protocols, open source protocols, they actually come from Europe. And it looks like there is this relentless past dependence where we can build on that to build the foundation of open source AI models. Uh, but in blue, these are collaboration between regions within the same country in Europe. And green, cross country. The big problem here, there's too much blue. Meaning, you look at regions in Norway, they will connect together. Region in France, they connect together. You don't have this collaboration that are cross country. To put it in simple terms, our AI systems, research innovation systems in Europe, they function at the country level. There is an AI strategy in France. There is one in Germany. There is one in the UK. There is one, I'm sure there is one in Norway. Uh, sure. But this, the one in Norway does not talk to the one in Sweden. So what we're doing, we're replicating the international who is who in AI. We're going to have tiny model everywhere that's never going to get picked up at the world, world scale, which means even you, Norwegians, are not going to use Norwegian AI. I, French person, will not use the French AI. I will use an American one because it scales, it's bigger. Another thing that, uh, so we have to integrate that. We have to find a model that basically integrates uh, European regions in AI. One thing that Europe is really good at, regulation. Ta-da! <laughs> These are the number of AI bills, and now you see Europe leading. <laughs> European Union has more than 100 different AI regulation initiatives or regulation, and each country has a lot of them. See Norway here. Norway accounts for 1.5% of the world AI regulation. <laughs> it, is, it is a force of China. It is an eighth of the United States. And, well, the UK and France, Germany, Austria, if you put everything together, Europe accounts for about 50% of all regulation in the world. But then, remember the maps I showed before? So we don't innovate, but we regulate. <laughs> and it's, there is this joke, by the way, because I work a lot in the US, I spend half of my time in the US, and I always get this joke, which, you know, start to be old, but it's like, there's this party, and then you have an American, and the American brings the software. And then, you invite a Chinese. Chinese bring the hardware. And then you invite a European and they say, I'll bring the regulation, right? <laughs> and that's a joke in the, in the tech world. And unfortunately, I mean, the data tells you that may, might be some truth in that. But in this case on AI, it might be actually a comparative advantage. Because it's important to know how to regulate and to think, because this technology, and I will close on that, this technology is very powerful. <sighs> you know, Facebook, how you regulate, GDPR, privacy, Ah, privacy of my internet data, Pff, okay, yes, maybe it's important, but it's not going to kill us. This has so much implication, so much implication, that that warrant is the, 
the fact to really think carefully before producing the technology and putting like really nice safeguards around that. So that can be one of our comparative advantage. And on that, I just want to say thank you and looking forward to the discussion. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much. I see that you have your glass of wine, and also you know that uh, we have to move this table. Is, yes. Should I do it, or is someone just okay. to help you with that? Right. Okay. Can do it. <laughs> we can. Uh... Okay. Um, I see that we also have a really active audience here, so prepare. I will open up for. Oh, sorry, you have to do it. So well, let's. Uh, uh, yeah, so. Okay. I just. So we, I didn't want to move it all the way. Because we were in. Uh, it was not good for the video, so we just had to so, take so it out. Take it, then I take my beer. Okay, <laughs> sorry for this. Okay, is it better now? Okay. 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 In you go. <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay. I, I wanted to open for you to give some comments, but I also will open for the audience to ask some questions afterwards. So just prepare that uh, if you want to have some questions to Pierre or Alex uh, or Andres, uh, welcome. But first, Andres, what's your take on this? Well, thank you very much, Celia. And uh, when Enya was going to comment on Pierre Alex, I said, I better prepare. <laughs> he is very good. He knows much more about AI than I do. In fact, he's one of the leaders about AI. I don't work on AI at all. So I said, I better leave a good amount of time, two hours, to prepare and get ready and be really intelligent and ask the right questions. <laughs> the problem is, is I realized that I, when I got to the hotel this afternoon, that I couldn't find my glasses. And that's a big problem. <laughs> because there's no artificial intelligence at the moment that allows me to read without my glasses. <laughs> and I felt powerless. So I phoned Rune, do you have my glasses? No, I must have left them in the, uh, in the, at the university. So I had to take the bus to the university. And then I had to come back. So there were my two hours gone. And I said, oh my god, it's 4.30. I'm going to be actually commenting uh, what uh, Pierre Alex is doing, and I'm not prepared at all. So what do I do? I turn to ChatGPT, <laughs> <laughs> and I say, I got Pierre Alex Balland coming. <laughs> He's really good. I don't know what to say. Can you please give me some comments? <laughs> and the good thing is that within 20 seconds, I got all the answers. <laughs> so. You get a university professor thinking that this is going to be good. And then what you get is a lot of artificial intelligence that actually does it better than I, I could have done before. And by the way, I'm not Andres, I'm his avatar. <laughs> oh, here. <laughs> so uh, Andres is, by the way, having a nap in the hotel because uh, <laughs> connections out there with the airplane were not very good. So what did ChatGPT tell me to ask? He said, Pierre Alex is going to be giving a lot of information that you're not familiar with. So please try to assimilate that information and not try to use your creativity or your empathy, because uh, otherwise he'll kill me. Um, don't use that. Use your capacity to predict, because you, after all, you are an avatar, to say, what is he going to say? What do you expect? And what can you get uh, later on? So the idea is that he has highlighted a complex geography of AI in which mostly Elon Musk plus two other guys are going to be better off. And all of you sitting over here, and excuse my, after all I'm an avatar, excuse my English, you're going to be screwed. <laughs> Why? Because you're going to lose your jobs, your paralegals or your lawyers or your whatever, but that's it. A computer, a machine, artificial intelligence is going to be able to do it much, much better, robot, than uh, you can do it, not perhaps not now, but within six months, or even as time thing go, things go in, in two weeks' time. So that's it. Um, I can just relax and just stay ho sleeping in the hotel because it's going to be done much, much better. So that's one of the things that, yes, we are probably on the uh, wrong hand side. But you highlighted two things that I want to highlight. First is that there are two types of geographies that seem to be emerging. The one is the geography of the generation 
of new AI, which is a winner takes all. And there's another geography, which is the geography of jobs related to AI, in which there are going to be winners and losers. Let me just start with the first one. You highlighted that there are two players, US and China, that Europe doesn't matter, that we're very good at regulation, and I'm going to go back into that uh, later on, but we are not really present, apart perhaps from Paris, from uh, Munich, from Eindhoven and uh, Philips, and that's really about it, and, uh, uh, but we don't win all players, but you forgot one type of player that seems to be growing, according to the FT, which is the Arab countries that are buying a lot of hardware, a lot of big chips that can provide and allow you to search and create these predictive models, and um, that are, according to some, the United Arab Emirates has uh, actually developed some artificial intelligence that is very, very good. The question here is first, do we need to worry that much about generating AI? Because you highlighted it's a winner takes all. It's only the top that is going to win. So we might end up trying to do a bit in Hungary, a bit in Estonia, which has 1.5 million people, a bit in Paris, but we haven't got the capacity to compete with Boston or the Silicon Valley. So can we really do it? Is it really worth putting money into it? Uh, or should we just say, that's it. Let's focus on the other geography, which is as important, not the geography of generation, but the geography of assimilation. Mm -hmm. Can we be better than others at assimilating? And then there's the geopolitics of this. What is the risk, not just for Europeans, but for, let's say, open societies and liberal societies like us or in the US, are having China as one of the major players, and also illiberal democracies like, for example, in the Gulf states, becoming major, major players in artificial AI. So that's the macro level, the global geography. But the other one is the micro level. You hinted, yes, you mainly focus on the generation, you didn't focus on the assimilation, and you were rather pessimistic about our potential to actually compete and develop and create more jobs. So you say, there will be some jobs that will be generated, but we don't know which ones. But all of your jobs, including mine, uh, are at stake and they might be lost. So next year, instead of having me doing my lectures, you'll be an there will be an avatar doing that. So first question, is that that bad? Because if it's my avatar talking right here and I'm having my nap in the hotel, my well-being has increased significantly. <laughs> so I'm just relaxing there. I'm, my avatar is talking to you. I don't have to worry. And probably the income that is being generated is far greater than if you had me just coming to talk here and just say the absolute nonsense I would do without the guidance of chat GPT or another equivalent uh, uh, artificial intelligence system. That's the first question. Second question related to that is there's a lot of people that say that yes, a lot of jobs are going to be lost, but the good thing is that we had a system that was skewed towards talent that was acquired through many years. Many people cannot acquire that talent. Not everyone can be at the forefront of their professions. But can their productivity not in increase significantly as a result of being able to use machine learning and therefore improve their capacity to deliver on their jobs because you, eventually you'll have to have someone to supervise the AI or work with AI there. So that's a, sec a second thing. The third thing is very much related to AI is going to facilitate and improve a lot of productivity in a lot of processes. It's not going to substitute completely in any way for the sort of things that were highlighted here at the beginning. The empathy, the hope, the capacity to choose, although well, hallucinate in which way, the capacity to make errors in ways that machines cannot make errors in the same way, and that would allow also to give other opportunities in the application of AI to daily activities that can probably facilitate and cover the gap that we have at the moment between things that can be done only in certain places and things that can be done and you can have a leap, not just in less developed regions of Europe, but also in less developed parts of the world. 
And then the final thing here, and I know there's a lot of questions, but uh, <laughs> if I'm really good as a European at regulating, is it in the long run allow me to go pay for my beers? So is that going to bring any sort of benefits? Or we need to go not just on the generation of AI, but also perhaps put much more emphasis, as I was highlighting, on the assimilation of AI, on being much better at transforming AI into good activities and activities that we can do on a daily basis, and also transform our routine activities with low productivity, because in Europe we have a serious problem of lack of productivity, into far more productive, far better in a way that would allow us to deliver much more growth, more development, and maintain the well-being that we have in Europe relative to other parts of the world. All right. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I told you, ChatGPT helps a lot. <laughs> so, Andres, I'm, I'm glad you prefaced by, by saying that you were not an expert. What, what would have it been if you were an expert? <laughs> um, no, that's not the avatar. That's Andres. Yeah. <laughs> right that's there. what you think. <laughs> <laughs> or it got way more advanced than before. Um, so thanks for the 14 questions. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be selective in my answers, uh, also because I have a tendency to answer 10 minutes per question. So just uh, also being mindful of, of you having opportunity to, to ask us what you, what you also want and care about. Um, so selectively. One that I think is super fundamental, really, this is something I, I feel very strongly about, is uh, does it matter if Europe produces AI or not? Yeah, it's like, uh, is it worth it to invest? Huge yes, because you cannot uh, decide the type of, like for instance, an AI can be a black box, right? And think about um, using that in, uh, in a criminal court. You want to understand how it works, you want transparency. So you cannot just open AI, it's one of the least transparent, uh, model out there, ChatGPT. That's that's the choice. Mistral, super transparent. So the fact that we c you can only decide about how the technology will be made if you build it. So you have we have to build it. We cannot let it. We cannot let it go. And it's also like ramification, in terms of like military components, uh, geopolitical like dependence. What, what, it's like GPS and Galileo. Galileo is doing a great job, actually better than GPS today. And it, it allows us to have an alternative. You know, you get into a fight with the US, better to have also your own navigation system. So to me, it's just too big to be like, okay, maybe it's fine to focus on adoption. When I work with the European Commission, way too often, is, the conversation I have is like, oh yeah, but let's just improve the uptake of AI in companies. Like, yeah, the uptake of American technology. No, if you want that to also translate into productivity and, and be able to buy more beers in Europe, we have to build it. We cannot just be a consumer. We have to be a producer. We have to be a producer of this most complex technology out there. So, um, and of course I can, ex I mean, I can develop, but that's, that's kind of the, the, the core message is like, yes, and it's not too late because we have a new wave of AI that seems to be building on open source. That I really insist on that, being um, into this community and the open source part, we have a window of opportunity. Let's not miss it. We had a window of opportunity with the web early on, and okay, we, we messed it up. Um, but let's, let's try not to replicate the mistake and, and, and unite. So I'm very anti French AI, Norway AI. Like this is a disaster, this constellation of AI regulation that you know, block collaboration, cooperation. Um, something like ITER, I don't know if you're familiar with ITER, for like nuclear fusion. It's based in France, uh, in, uh, in the south uh, of France. Collaboration between 35 countries minus Russia now uh, to build like, uh, well, nuclear fusion, right? And so basically to go, like there are two challenges today, for, uh, or today, for the 21st century. Complete energy abundance, which apparently uh, nuclear fusion is a good way to think about it, and uh, abundance of the ability to compute and, and, and create intelligence. We, we cannot miss these two most essential parts uh, of the green and digital transition. Um, another one I think that very, very relevant uh, point that you made is, um, well, 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to be better off if I can uh, have an avatar giving the lecture now, and 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 that's that's a really great question. And if you think about, but then that connects to the to AI and the metaverse, which is very interesting. And I was giving a talk on on, on exactly that topic on the metaverse on on Friday last week uh, with experts with Pico, a company that does metaverse technologies. And the metaverse today is completely different from a year ago. A year ago, the metaverse was this very silly looking avatar of uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Have you seen that? With like the Eiffel Tower in the back, you know, it's like, come on, that's that's it. That's where 10 billion went. I mean, it was a joke. Everybody laughed. And then when um, uh, Zuckerberg renamed Facebook into Meta to show that that was the goal of the company to build the metaverse, people were like, oh my God, that's that's a joke. Watch the interview of Lex Friedman, Friedman with Mark Zuckerberg in the metaverse. It, it looks like what we're having here. So fast forward, and, and we might not be that far from what you're describing and having an avatar here. We might not be that far. But also you will not have to be here, right? You could also be not taking a nap, but like being from uh, your hotel room. And, and, and a big question is that, yeah, it's like, <laughs> will it be um, better also that we might not have to travel, things like this? It's just a much better way of communicating. Uh, and that's, these are questions for economic geographers as well, right? Because we had the same question with the internet. If we can have a Zoom call, um, do we need to, be, to have face-to-face -face, uh, interaction, physical proximity, and things like that? So, but that opens another set of questions. Um, but would we be better off uh, to, to kind of follow up on that? Uh, I'm absolutely sure that as any new technology, uh, it will basically, it's a tide that will lift all boats. So we are in this room all way better off than the Stavanger farmers of 300 years ago that were dying very young and putting a lot of uh, their own energy into producing just energy to, to reproduce the energy that puts that, right? So food, basically. So it, we're all getting better. So at the same time, with this type of technology, and AI is the same as others before in that respect, we'll all get better off, but some will <laughs> get way better, way faster. So you will have at the same time more productivity, more wealth, but also a very unequal distribution of this wealth. You're, you're creating some my gods, right? So we have to really think about it. And that also connects to um, uh, life uh, expansion technologies, uh, which is another issue, but also connected to that. So there is also, and I'm kind of looping up to another issue I want to address uh, from your comment. It's like um, not having too much of a, I, what I dislike in the conversation on the geography of jobs and uh, AI and the future of work is a bit of a tale of job loss and just focusing on that part. Because historically, uh, it's never been the case. We always created more jobs than we, uh, we, we took away. All right, look at the, 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 the portfolio of jobs 300 years ago and the, the portfolio of jobs that we have today. So we created better jobs and AI is actually automating a lot of tasks that are not that fun. The cognitive tasks that are not that fun, right? If you look at picture of Albert Einstein, you will notice that there is always Albert Einstein with another man next to him, and he was his computer. Like that was the name, the name of an occupation. You had computers, they were humans that were just really good at computing stuff. Now we, do, we have computers that compute better than humans, and that's not a bad thing, right? It's not something that everybody misses. So a lot of the things that AI will do will, be, will make us, all of us, better off, and will most likely also create new jobs just the amount of jobs that you will need to uh, make sure that nothing goes wrong, you know, might be also substantial, like the amount of jobs to verify. It's a bit like you're giving a 10 personal assistant to all of you, well, you can do more stuff, but then you have this hierarchy where you need to have like more management and things like this. So overall, I, I don't think uh, we need to be like in a tale of, um, of, uh, of job loss and, and, and be super negative on average, doesn't mean some place won't be affected. It, won't, it doesn't mean some of us won't be really negatively affected. Uh, psychologists of AI that work on this topic tell us that even if economists find a way with UBI, for instance, which I think is the way to go, by the way, um, with UBI to make sure that you, know, you, you don't die of hunger and you can meet your physical needs, even that will create a generation of people that will lose meaning. Because how many people define themselves with a job? Andres, professor at LSE. That's a big part of our personality. That's a big part of who we are toward the world. 
our every, everyday job, if you're, you know, uh, raising kids, working with people that have handicap, that's a huge part of who you are. What you do, your job is a huge part of who you are. What is the meaning of your life? You wake up every day. And then, by the way, to, to, to have a look at that, let's look at very, very rich kids. Kids from parents are very, very rich. They have a disproportional um, consumption of, of, um, of, uh, of drugs, for instance. So the, the meaning of that, what, what is left once we don't necessarily have to work, or a big part of us won't have to, to work and do jobs? Okay. Good. Thank you so much. And uh, so, um, I also had a list of questions, sir, but I leave it because you asked 14 questions. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I opened the floor for some in the audience to ask questions to both of them. And uh, welcome. Yeah. Um, so, uh, my name is Bernard Goodman. I work for uh, the National Account. Uh, um, I'm just wondering how are you regarding um, the, uh, the plan that the EU has to be European universities uh, in all of this, especially in regards to uh, facilitating you know, quality research on diffusion and, and transport networks? Like, do you, you think that that's a good framework or is it a flawed model? forcing the different universities to work together in such a way. Um, in the context of AI? In the context of AI or in general? In particular. Well, I don't think uh, we really have a choice, but having very strong investment in AI, and that comes by building AI literacy. And I was having this conversation actually with the uh, Director General on Research and Innovation. And you have two models. Either you try to transform existing universities. Good luck. <laughs> um, I tried in my own university. And the response I, 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 I get is, uh, we've been teaching SPSS for 20 years, and everybody's fine with that. And our students are like, no, that's not what we need. So either you try to transform universities, but that's really hard also because that's not a, um, a, a competency of the, of the EU, right? I mean, this is a member state, so it's a bit complicated. Or you try to create polls, and like the European University Institute where the EU will directly create something next to it. You know, not, not like transform from within, but grow out of it, which is also a model that was done in France with the Toulouse School of Economics, where it was too hard to transform the, the system itself, so you just create a foundation, something like this, next to it. And, you have, and to me, that's the, the, the way to do it. You cannot have a <laughs> completely integrated research innovation system if you don't build the underlying education network. And it's just way faster if, you know, it's, it's, it's much faster and direct. And the connections are super important, super important. So to me, one of the most successful EU program is Erasmus. Why? Because with Erasmus, you have someone from Spain that lives in Netherlands and marries someone from Norway. <laughs> and, and you have a generation that believes that they are Europeans before being Spanish or French. And, and we have to break these boundaries. These boundaries are real. We see that here, we see that in other ways, and we have to break them. Um, so also creating these poles that are strongly connected, uh, to me, is actually the way to go. I don't see uh, from a, if you want the EU to have an impact and if you want to integrate the system, that's probably the, the, the best way to think about it. Okay, then we have another question here. My name is Jiren Essa, I'm very happy. I have lost my job, so I have nothing to lose. Okay. <laughs> I have hardware for it, and I follow the electronics, which is in the for 50 years. Mm. And I'm living in my backyard. It's a question about the large data center, which mm. is going to consume energy equivalent to the mm. Stavanger. Mm. With the vision you kind of show of all the possibilities, have you any idea how many times the amount of energy used for digital services today compared to what will be in 20 years in, in the most experience? First question. And in Copernomics, I learned about this world. It's getting nastier and nastier. We are very dependent on global uh, connections. Uh, and maybe 
the global world is falling, more, uh, falling apart. And, and you go to cyber warfare, which is much more advanced than uh, the small hackers, which are going on now, where you may use your global network. What is it worth? Thank you. <laughs> Great questions. Um, I'll, the first one um, was about the hardware part and energy consumption. It, it is, so of course, that's not my research, but I could also have shown studies that completely uh, answer your question. There is a consensus on that. When well, consensus, of course, you make projections and you have to make two assumptions that you can predict the demand of energy, and that you can predict where the energy comes from, right? So because the source of energy are evolving and the source, the way data centers are powered in Norway is very different from the way data centers are powered in China. In China, they tend to be powered by coal, in France, by nuclear, in Norway, I'm not sure, probably a lot of wind uh, energy or other. Uh, so the CO2 intensity is, is what matters. Huh? The energy in itself, if, you have some, if you're completely carbon neutral, you know, uh, you have a lot of data center that can be also powered by uh, volcanoes with geothermal energy, things like this. Like you can delocalize and, uh, and, and, and be smart about it. But clearly, clearly 100%, this um, uh, large language models and the way they train use a lot of computing power. Therefore, it's a very energy, it's a huge energy consumption. Yes, 100%. And this demand is just going like this. OK, so yes. Um, so the challenge here is the twin transition. The challenge is energy abundance to provide compute abundance. So energy abundance and getting to a CO2 emission that is lower um, or, or carbon neutral by 2050 is not something crazy in most European countries. If you look, actually, take the UK. Since 1990, the UK had a decoupling between the energy uh, uh, consume going down and the energy, uh, sorry, and the, and the growth. So it's going in the right direction. All European countries, all of them are doing this in terms of energy consumption. Per capita or, or overall, they're doing this. The problem at, at the, the, the scale of the planet is actually not what we're talking about. The problem is very, very, very large countries, China, India, together more than 3 billion people, almost four, that increase their living standard and basically start taking the plane, eating meat, consuming. And that is something where, from the youth standpoint, you have no control. But that's where the CO2 emission come from in the, in the, in the future. Um, and <laughs> therefore, same with like the debates on degrowth and things like that, right? It's like, yeah, you can try to eat less meat here. And that's great. It doesn't mean you cannot do both, right? And, and, uh, but that's never going to solve the increase in demand of energy at the worldwide scale. To do that, you have to solve the problem of energy abundance. You have to find a technology that produces clean energy at scale, like, for instance, maybe uh, nuclear fusion. Um, so that's, that's the first answer. And the second one was about... Um, Geopolitics. Yeah, but that was... A, uh, Losing your the network. network so. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure really what. I don't see globalization as a bad thing necessarily. Um, I like the fact that humans are interconnected. Okay. It's a great thing when uh, so. the great thing that happens when humans become more connected is uh, information diffuse and, and good things diffuse. Also bad things, right? So we saw that with the pandemic. Um, the fact that we're super connected means if something really bad diffused, then uh, we're all kind of in the same boat. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily uh, an, an issue at this scale uh, in the context of AI. Like, I don't, I, I would not necessarily connect them. I think there are other ways to, to worry about why uh, this physical interconnection uh, and actually trying to find shutdown mechanisms are important for the, let's say, survival of our species. Um, Andres, yeah. you wanted to just comment on the, on the, quickly on, on this. Uh, I just said we have to also close the session. So all uh, oh, right, already. So yeah, uh, but uh, now, quick. That, now on the on the geopolitical uh, thing, globalization has not been perhaps good. It has been really, really good. Uh, it has over the last thirty years got more people out of poverty than in the last in the previous four hundred years. Uh, most of them have been fundamentally in less developed countries. We have had also low inflation, better access to public goods and services, massive improvements in health. The problem is that not everyone has benefited in the same way from globalization. And a lot of the 
people and places that have laws have been fundamental in the developed world, many of the middle classes, uh, according to Branko Milanovic, mm. but also in some developing countries, uh, inland areas that have lost significantly. And that has created significant tensions within our nation states. And that's creating now this backlash against globalization and the, many of the geopolitical problems that we have. Because, I mean, there are many reasons why Russia invaded Ukraine. But Russia invaded Ukraine for one fundamental reason, that you had Putin as, on the one hand, president of Russia for the last 20 years, that managed to generate some sort of growth in the first 10 years, in the last 10 years, nothing. And therefore, in order to stay in power and not lose power, you have to go illiberal, you have to go, and you have to find enemies. And this is what we are seeing, not just with Russia, so, and finding external enemies like Ukraine a country that you think you're going to invade in four days and that's it. Of course, you miscalculate. But when that proliferates across the world, what we are having is going towards a much greater, much more problematic world. So that's why when you deal with AI, and I have nothing against the concentration of wealth in certain individuals, but we have to make sure that the benefits that any sort of new technology or any sort of greater connection and connectivity would generate are distributed in a relatively homogenous way, I would not say equal, no. but uh, are distributed in one way across individuals and across territories. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, we have to uh, close up the session. Thank you all for uh, joining this session and thank you to Pierre and uh, Andres. We will be around, so if uh, some wants to ask them some question, you can come up uh, afterwards and uh, enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you.